Good evening and you're very welcome to the John and Pat Hume Foundation event as part of our Human Rights Festival week. So this event that we're holding tonight is part of a series that the John and Pat Hume Foundation are holding around the unfinished business of the Good Friday Agreement, looking at those gaps within the Good Friday Agreement that have yet to be implemented. And tonight's event and the theme of tonight's event is the fight for human rights and equality. I'm very pleased uh, that joining us tonight we have Mike Nesbitt. Um, Mike, as you know, is an MLA and has rep represented the Strangford constituency since 2011, the year I left the Assembly. Um, and he led the party, the Ulster Unionist Party, from 2012 to 2017. He is the Deputy Chairperson of the Ad Hoc Committee on a Bill of Rights and he's currently the Economy Spokesperson. He is, of course, as you will all know him, as a former broadcaster, and he's also a board member of the John and Pat Hume Foundation. Monica McWilliams, or Monica Mary McWilliams, as to give her her, her full title, um, is um, probably best known as a Northern Irish academic activism. Um, Monica, or Monica has been involved in the peace process. She's been a human rights defender. Um, she was uh, part of the Women's Coalition, of course, that were involved in the peace negotiations that led to the Good Friday Agreement. Um, her activism started early on in her life from the civil rights movement um, through to the peace process, then the Human Rights Commission, and of course her pioneering work on documenting the uh, domestic abuse and domestic violence that exists in, in Northern Ireland. And her research with the University of Ulster was pioneering in terms of uh, changing laws and policy that exists in Northern Ireland. Um, Monica is also uh, a member of the John, John and Pat Hume Foundation, so I think it's very apt that uh, Monica starts off our discussion tonight. Just to say to you that we're broadcasting live, we have a facility for you to ask questions, so please feel free to submit your questions um, and join in the conversation here at home or wherever you happen to be watching from. Thanks a lot, Monica. Thanks very much, Don. And I'm very happy that the John and Pat Hume Foundation asked me to give, I think it's the first of a series of lectures tonight, and it's a good moment to be asked to give it because we're on the eve of the December 10th, which is the anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And that's where I want to start because this has been a year of anniversaries and probably a year in which we've all had to take time out to think and reflect on whose rights need protection. Um, and they're very different rights today than when the five main drafters of the Universal Declaration sat down in 1948. There was Eleanor Roosevelt from the United States, Rennie Kassan, who was Jewish in origin, um, from France, uh, Jean Pen Hoon, a playwright, which I think is fantastic when you have playwrights involved and artists involved like Vakla Havel from Czechoslovakia, who wrote um, Politics is the Art of the Possible, who was a playwright who became the president. Um, so this Chinese playwright and philosopher had a huge role to play. Um, there was Charles Malik from the Lebanon, and John Humphreys from Canada, who was the legal academic and civil servant. And that reminds me of the keepers of the pen of the Good Friday Agreement. It is the diplomats and often the civil servants who do the drafting, um, but get much less attention. Um, and alongside those were 14 nations, which included countries as far apart as the Soviet Union and Egypt and India, but let's not forget the United Kingdom. So they were at the table. Um, the most notable exception back then was sub-Sahara African countries still largely colonised by the European powers, although in enunciating a set of internationally agreed standards for all humankind, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was subsequently to provide a lever in some of their struggles for independence. So I want to start with that point, the important point that rights are universal and interdependent. We all come from one race, the human race, and all human beings are entitled to have their rights respected equally. When I held the position of Chief Commissioner of the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission, an institution, by the way, that was established as a result 
of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Uh, it mandated myself and my nine commissioners um, to draft the advice on the Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. Bryce Dixon had led the first commission and had undertaken one of the largest public participation exercises ever undertaken in Northern Ireland, where they went out to the people and consulted and asked, what rights do you think need to be protected? So we produced that advice actually on the 60th anniversary of the, in 2008, of the Universal Declaration. This is the 73rd anniversary and presented it to the Secretary of State at the time. And two of the commissioners, Daphne Trimble from the Ulster Unionist Party, who were in an alliance with the Conservative Party in 2008, um, and Jonathan Bell from the Democratic Unionist Party, the DUP, um, rejected the advice and disagreed with us, the other eight commissioners. Ian Knox, who is the wonderful cartoonist in the Irish News, drew a cartoon of me standing at a candy counter, sweetie counter, with Jonathan and Daphne deciding on which pieces of candy they wanted to select. And over the counter, there was a sign saying Human Rights Commission. And I'm standing there saying it's not a pick and mix. So that's where I want to start. Are we still fighting over who gets to pick and mix? Whose rights should be protected here in Northern Ireland? Um, and I think that's a, a fight that is still going on all these years later and perhaps the reason why the Bill of Rights that was required by the Good Friday Agreement in 1998 is still not um, brought forward in 2021. And it reminded me of what Chang Pan Chun had said back in 48, using a Confucian proverb to explain why the Universal Declaration was needed. Sweep the snow in front of one's own door. Overlook the frost on others' roof tiles. And I think that's what we continue to do, and hence, perhaps in the title of this talk, it's a fight for rights and equality. But back in 1948, the aims of the Declaration were probably much the same as what we were aiming to do in the Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. First, to enhance the protection for individuals from abuse wherever they live, regardless of other cultural or religious differences to foster peace for the future, given the abuses of the terrible 30 years of conflict that we've lived through. And I brought the peace agreement as it was published with me. And the very second point it makes in its declaration of support is, the tragedies of the past have left a deep and profoundly regrettable legacy of suffering. We must never forget those who have died or been injured and their families, but we can best honor them through a fresh start in which we firmly dedicate ourselves to the achievement of reconciliation, tolerance and mutual trust. And the words that we're talking about tonight are at the end of that sentence. And to the protection and vindication <coughs> of the human rights of all. So what does the human rights of all actually mean? And so the third aim is to promote understanding of the inherent dignity and equal worth of all members of the human family. That's what the Universal Declaration said. And in many ways, those principles are exactly the same. So perhaps both you, Don and Mike, could address and assess the progress that we've actually made since 1998 on the vindication of human rights for all. As I know, in trying to persuade the parties about the human rights that we were recommending as a commission to be in the Bill of Rights, it requires a great deal of patience and persistence. Reflecting back on 1948, if you remember at the time, only 48 governments accepted those rights when today 192 member states take them as given. So tomorrow on December the 10th, we will celebrate with the rest of the world in the four corners of the globe, International Human Rights Day. It is now today the most translated document in the world. Parts of its terms are cited so often that it's become generally accepted as part of customary international law. But even then, back then, the question arose, should it be a legally binding document? And that's the same question that's being asked by the Bill of Rights. So why do unionists prefer the words charter or covenant as opposed to a bill, as opposed to a legislative document? That even I translated, or at least transcribed it, my attempt was, 
to set down a range of principles in the preamble. And I'd actually drafted them myself in the advice because that's the spirit in which you take the rights forward. But they're not judiciable. They're not enforceable. What came after that was which rights should be judiciable, brought forward into the courts. So that argument still goes on today. And as you know, Don, um, unionists were very fearful about giving too much power to the courts and arguing that the legislator is the place where you make law um, and that the judges should take their place and not have priority. But that's not um, the understanding of human rights that I know in terms of how the European Convention rights were implemented. And actually it was the judges because we were involved in much of the training after the convention was brought to the domestic courts known as the Human Rights Act. Two years later, in 2000, which was to give the judiciary an opportunity to be trained in what, how did you make these enforceable in your own domestic courts. Um, and the judiciary told us that it was a really good thing that they were now underlying the decision making of the courts. And as I discovered as a chief commissioner, it was professionals and practitioners who also found this really important. For instance, social services would say, we now have to take due diligence before we make a decision to take a child or a newborn baby off the mother because she's had a previous addiction problem. We shouldn't automatically assume that she's not best placed to mind this child. Um, and similarly, my work on domestic violence would tell me that the po positive obligation of the state needs to take into account the human rights of a woman who has her rights violated particularly if there's threats to her life. And all of that has improved the practice of professionals. Um, and the judges knew that. It doesn't need the courts. It actually needs all of us. It's everybody's business. The last place you should be is in the courts. You only go to the courts when something has gone wrong. But does it mean, and in terms of having a fight over whether you need judiciable rights, or should you just simply leave it to the legislative body? Um, to decide for laws and policies. And that laws and policies can be changed, whereas a constitutional document, which you have in the Republic of Ireland or you have in other countries, um, exists and underlines um, the laws so that people have to go to the constitution first to see that it doesn't fly in the face. It's a very difficult document to amend, whereas it's very easy to throw out a law uh, and bring in a new one. So. I also go back to what Eleanor Roosevelt said at the time. She said, where does human rights begin? In small places, so close, so small, that they can't be seen in any maps of the world. The world of the individual person, the neighbourhood he lives or she lives in, the school or college he or she attends. Such are the places where every man, woman and child seeks equal justice, equal opportunity, equal dignity, without discrimination. Unless these rights have meaning there, they have little meaning anywhere. And one of the most difficult things of all is to make rights not abstract or theoretical, but meaningful to you and me. I, it came home to me when I got cancer, um, but I had no idea that one of the rights that I had fought for as a commissioner in terms of the right to health, um, it was a parasitical right. What does that mean? It meant that the right to life, where you get medicine or medication to fight cancer, um, wasn't available in Northern Ireland, the drug Herceptin. So I asked Michael Machimsey, one of your colleagues in the Ulster Unionist Party, who was the Minister of Health at the time, that he needed to assess this in terms of my right to life, as I later came to understand, um, to have this Herceptin drug, which was not available to women here. It was in England, but it was a postal code lottery. Mm. So he did the assessment. Now, it did require extra funds, um, but it did come in. And it was under that principle. So we didn't go to court. The department actually assessed it, looked at it, and said, yes, this is a discrimination. Um, and it is also threatening your right to life. Little did I know that 10 years later, I would be the recipient of that very right. Um, and it just shows you how you fight for somebody else's rights, but one day they may be your right. A bit like the blood donation. You give blood because someone needs it, not because you're going to run out and get it back. And I remember bringing the blood dono donation service to the assembly, the first assembly, where we laid out all the beds in the long gallery. 
and we gave blood. And I said to the media, that proves you can take blood from a stone. Mm -hmm. Um, I also said, I think it was Alex Maskin, perhaps it was Ian Paisley Jr. were in the two beds on either side of the long gallery. And I said, either one of them could get knocked down and need the blood, but they won't question that it came from someone who they disagreed with. Um, So it's that kind of reciprocal relationship that really does make rights meaningful. But how far have we gone away from that? Throughout my time in post as Human Rights Commissioner, I had to repeatedly make the point that human rights would not mean anything if those charged with their oversight failed to act because of political opposition. The Commission had the powers to undertake investigations, but even that was disputed. Um, Ian Paisley stood up in Westminster at the time and said, do not give any more powers to this Commission. And Eddie McGrady from the SDLP fought for the extension of more powers and said if a Commission's worth its salt and it's internationally accredited at the UN, it needs to have those powers. Mm -hmm. Why would such a fight take place? Why would you not see the importance of having an independent Commission? Um, And why does that fight go on in terms of empowering an institution that oversees and monitors human rights. The same fight went on in relation to people of in, in detention. When I stood up for the rights of people um, in Hyde Bank or McGilligan or McGabry, others, particularly conservative minded, would say, oh, that's a villain's charter, those rights. But how you look after your prisoners in any country is a sign of your democracy. Exactly. But that was a fight and it was a very difficult one. Likewise, The strip searching issue, which if we go back in time, um, was it something that was exerted over women as a power and control? Or was it for safety in terms of not bringing drugs and weapons into the prison? And that still goes on. I was very pleased that we succeeded in ensuring that the women in Hyde Bank are no longer strip searched, full body searched, as the prison would like to say it. It's a half and half where you hand the clothes out over the door and then you hand over the rest. So you're not standing naked. And anybody like me who grew up in a school, like a convent school, where I was, we were told not even to go to the showers without clothes on. So that issue of human dignity and the protection of human dignity um, remains. And did it go back to your political thinking about, it was very hard for us to win the hearts and minds of those in the loyalist community because Republicans made this an issue for them in terms of their ideology, Mm. rather than a human rights. And it was to the trade union movement, of which I was the first reserved seat for women on the Northern Ireland Committee, that we managed to get that eventually taken forward as a human rights issue. But it was very contentious. Then I'll um, talk about, quickly, the other rights. (coughs) Political and civil rights back at the time of the Universal Declaration were strongly advocated by the West The countries of the West wanted them. The countries of Soviet Union and socialist countries wanted social and economic rights. And in fact, in the global north, we still talk about political and civil rights, the right not to be interrogated uh, through torture, etc., becoming dominant. Whereas in African countries that I visit, it's the social and economic rights that they talk about, the right to water, the right to health, the right to no reversion on their standards. Um, And those were the rights I found very difficult. Um, And again, unionists find it difficult to accept the importance of these seeing them as policy decisions rather than rights. But it's the concept of progressive realization that I was trying to put forward, that you don't go backwards, you build and build and build depending on the resources of the country. Mm -hmm. And where did that come home? The pandemic brought it home that there, the right to health isn't dependent on whether you've got resources, whether you're rich or poor. The protection of your health is protection of my health. And I think that's better understood today. It was Albie Sachs from South Africa who drafted, along with Kader Asmal, actually came here in exile to Trinity College. And um, he was in Southampton, Kader was in Dublin. And it was on a kitchen table in, in Dublin they drafted those rights for South Africa. Um, and. Many people argued afterwards, this is a bill for whites, but in the transition from conflict to peace, it's a a bill for everyone. Because they thought that the whites were then the minority, Mm. 
and they were the only ones who were going to gain, given all the abuses that had happened to the blacks. So there's the understanding of rights for all. And I'll be often talked about how difficult it was to get through that this constitution, this Bill of Rights, um, vindicated both blacks and whites in the new South Africa. Um, and I think that was really important. Um, and, you know, the social and economic rights, if you're an asylum seeker, facing destitution in the country that you're seeking asylum is as bad as facing the potential for deportation back to your country of origin where you were prosecuted. So trying to see the need for the interdependency of those rights still remains um, a fight. So um, let me kind of come to a conclusion because I'd rather have a discussion on this, is the issue around having independent bodies overseeing the and producing the advice. For instance, Chris Patton was asked to do that and a set of independent advisors and commissioners drafted the Patton report. When he produced that, it was up to Westminster to legislate. It didn't come to me in the First Assembly or to any of the people in the First Assembly to decide whether or not we would accept the Patton report. It went to Westminster. It seems to me the same should exist in relation to the Bill of Rights. Why would you be looking for consensus in, amongst um, a group that is so divided on these issues? You do not go to the lowest common denominator on the international standards. Um, but I believe Westminster um, has reneged on its duty. And it was in, again, the Hillsborough Declaration following the Good Friday Agreement that it said it would legislate. Uh, and it still hasn't. Um, so wh is there still a fight? And we see that this committee that you sit on, Mike, or have sat on, the Ad Hoc Committee, which was meant to be the way through it, has still not made an agreement. And we're back to this. Um, DUP, I think, have taken the view that it should be principles and not rights as the way forward. And clearly others see it as entitlements. There's also a fight over duties and responsibilities um, instead of the notion that these are entitlements. Back in the day of the Universal Declaration, they didn't list duties and responsibilities. They actually talked about our responsibility to the community, not even to the state, in the view that I have a responsibility to you as part of my community. Now, we saw how that went wrong during the parades, uh, debacle of, of Drum Cree, and the need to respect proportionate rights, the right to protest and to process is important, but not of it overlords the right to live a peaceful life um, and not to be corralled, I guess, in your own community. So hence the notion of relative rights, that my right is relative to your right in terms of accepting your right to live in peace, my right to still be able to protest where it's not going to create a huge disorder to you. But their fight here over the Prades Commission, overseeing that and making the decisions um, independently still goes on. Um, so those are some of the issues I just wanted to talk about. And finally, I'll finish on the notion of levelling up. I can't believe that we still have let that gap exist between us and the south of Ireland. We were to produce a charter where there was to be a... We did produce a charter in the Human Rights Commission on when I was commissioner, and we handed it over to the Speaker of the Assembly, and we handed it over uh, to the Rochtes in Dublin. It's gathered dust ever since. No one's taken it down and looked, what are the equivalencies in these rights? It came to my attention with the death of Dennis Donaldson, who lived in Northern Ireland, was murdered in Donegal. Um, the way that the coroners oversee an inquest in the Republic is light years behind how a coroner in Northern Ireland, who is a member of the judiciary, oversees our inquests. It's a local doctor in Letterkenny who looks after those inquests. And all these years later, after Dennis Donaldson's death, there still has not been an inquest. That's only one example of levelling up. Mm -hmm. um, and so if both countries have ratified and indeed enforced the Human Rights Act under the European Convention, how do we have such differences? And therein lies an issue for the unionist community. If rights are meant to be the protection of minorities, mm -hmm. we no longer talk about in this country, minorities and majorities. The demographics have completely changed. So hence, 
who should fear human rights when it could be the protection of both communities and those who don't identify with either? And I'll finish with a right that has never been enforced, and the Emma de Souza case raised it, the right to be British, Irish or both. Look at how we did not bring that in, in terms of the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland, and look at the mess that left, left us in. And so I'll finish by saying that when I was Chief Commissioner, I was asked to draft advice with my commissioners on the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland. Well, was that only the past, the conflict, or were we to look at the future? What about homophobia? What about ethnic minorities? What about the changes of the beautiful place that we would like to live in that brings in and welcomes all the mix that we live amongst in terms of our neighbours? And the other piece of that, in terms of the particular circumstances, was that we were to adhere to the international standards. So how do you do that? Do you forget about what the international standards say? And then came the issue of sovereignty. Well, I would say that when the Americans drafted the, their constitution and their Bill of Rights, it wasn't just the laws of the land that they put in. It was also, and people forget this, and the treaties that we have ratified. And so the combination of those two is how we in Northern Ireland should be looking to our future. Thank you, Monica. Um, that's given us <coughs> lots to think about. And hopefully you at home will join our conversation now um, by submitting um, some questions via our, our YouTube channel. Mike, your, your initial thoughts, please, on, on Monica's a tour de force there from, from mm. Monica, as I expected. <laughs> but I'm going to start with the reality, although it's a negative one. That ad hoc committee on the Bill of Rights set up under New Decade, New Approach, has hit a brick wall mm. because the DUP uh, don't want to play. And I, I don't understand why unionists disregard rights because, as Monica says, they're for everybody. Mm. And, I mean, whatever about what happened 100 years ago, nobody owns Northern Ireland in 2021. We're all minorities, so why wouldn't you want to have rights protected and enshrined uh, mm. in law? Mm. Uh, and if we're talking about unfinished business, if it could be a little bit broader than, than rights, I think the real unfinished business is about relationships. Mm. And I'm really pleased you quoted the second paragraph of the, of the agreement. You know, this fresh start, building relationships in terms of reconciliation, tolerance, building trust, showing each other mutual respect. Mm. That's not there. In fact, it's getting worse. And I mean, of course, it's built on the, the famous John Hume three strands of internal north, south, east, west. I think Brexit and the protocol now, particularly east, west, mm. is, is putting a strain on. And if the relationships aren't right, you have no foundation uh, to move forward, which is another argument to have rights enshrined mm. uh, in, in law. And in the 10 years I've been at Storm, and a lot of things have surprised me, not necessarily in a good way. But one of the big ones is, because we have power sharing, what we call consociational government, people need to realise as soon as the votes are counted, you're not political opponents anymore, you're partners. Mm. You're supposed to be partners around that table. And I've never seen any sign of it. I've never sat at the executive. Mm. But all the ministers I've spoken to, have said no it, it doesn't work that way like if you're a minister you come in and you're a minister from another mm -hmm. party and you say I've got a problem mm -hmm. and Monica says well have you tried X Y or Z and you go gee that's brilliant I thought of that that doesn't happen mm -hmm. because it's still you know party political and if you can't get beyond the sense of party political and understand there's a greater good mm -hmm. you're not going to get anywhere and if it wasn't for for John Hume and David Trimble and Monica and the others uh, in Castle Buildings back in 1998, realising there was a greater good, we wouldn't be here mm. today, Monica, with, with her copy mm. uh, of the agreement. Mm. So, in, 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 and in terms of rights, I've heard people, politicians say, we don't want to give control to the courts. But the ad hoc committee heard from for Justice Gillen, from uh, former Lord Chief Justice Declan Morgan, and basically they were saying, we, we don't really want to get involved. So, for example, if you are coming to me and saying, uh, I want you to rule because I don't think the budget is giving enough money for social housing, for the sake of talk. Mm. 
Declan says, well, you're not getting past my door. Not going to happen. That's nothing to do with me. That is a political decision. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're coming me, to me and saying the Minister for, for Housing is only building social housing in Protestant or Catholic or Unionist or Nationalist mm -hmm. areas, yeah, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll hear that case. Mm -hmm. So w where, is, where is the objection that is coming out of Unionist quarters mm -hmm. to, to a Bill of Rights? And, and I just want to, I suppose, make my position clear because in joining the PUP, the PUP were always in favour of a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. It was part of the party manifesto when I joined the party very early on um, and continued to push for it throughout the negotiations. And in fact, in 1998, we were very excited. Um, I mean, tonight is the eve of, of John Hume and David Trimble receiving the Nobel Peace Prize on the 10th of December, 1998. And I remember the excitement at the time, the euphoria at the time, that um, and, and the push to get the Human Rights Act through Westminster to make sure that the Human Rights Commission had as much teeth as possible, as much power as possible, because that's what we needed in this society when we were building um, peace and stability and, and coming out of the conflict. Yes, we had a political agreement, but we had much, much more to do beyond that. So we, as a, as a unionist, I was really excited about, about getting a Bill of Rights because I could see the disparity. I could see the neglect um, within my own working class community and other working class communities. And I saw the Bill of Rights as, as something that we should all aspire to, that we, we should all see, want to see implemented. But then I was reminded very sharply that, you know, we live in such a divided society um, and what we call the zero sum game. So one side of the community will say, what's good for us is bad for them and vice versa. So what's good for them is bad for us. And I think unionism has really stuck to that in terms of everything, particularly when it comes to a Bill of Rights, particularly when it comes to issues around the assembly and policy and everything else. We haven't managed to move beyond that zero sum. Yes, people can say, I'm a conservative, you know, laissez-faire, hands off government, people are responsible for their own, um, you know, their own lifestyle, their own um, life outcomes and what have you. But there has to be basic standards in our society that we need to adhere to. Hmm. And, a, and a Human Rights Commission, the Human Rights Act and a Bill of Rights would set those out clearly. It's not interfering with government policy and budget. It's actually saying you have a responsibility to provide this across the piste for everyone in this society. And mm. I, just anyone listening would need to be reminded that when Gusty Spence and David Irvine mm. went before the days of the Good Friday Agreement to the Downing Street, for before the Downing Street mm. Declaration, mm. that's where those rights, safeguards and equality of opportunity section was put in. Mm. And that's where it's in the Downing Street Declaration. It was Gusty mm. and mm. David that insisted mm. on the right of free political thought on the right to freedom and expression of religion. Um, other rights, of course, were drafted there, and we drafted the one which unfortunately ended up as an aspiration on the right of women to full and political participation. participation. If I had to go back now, and in retrospect's a good person to have at the table, of mm -hmm. course, yeah. it yeah. would be to make those rights constitutional yeah. and not aspirational. Quotas. We made a huge mistake, but on all of them, mm. They just, they're sitting there. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not a guarantee. They are an aspiration. So we should remember that it was the Loyalist mm -hmm. Party, the Progressive Unionist Party, and as far back mm -hmm. as the 1970s. Mm -hmm. in, and in fact, even 1965, it was Sheila Murnan, I think, mm -hmm. who stood up in the, first, in, the, in the Assembly, who put forward a Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. I think it's Alba McGuinness who later said, had only we introduced those basic mm -hmm. rights then where would we have been in terms of mm -hmm. what came next? Mm -hmm. But, and then it was Gary McMichael's father, John McMichael, who drafted the consensus document and mm -hmm. a Bill of Rights mm -hmm. for Northern Ireland. So in some ways we shouldn't simply have this generic term unionism in terms of opposition. It was mm -hmm. actually yeah. working class unionists mm -hmm. 
that were who pushing. were pushing for yeah. these rights. And, and I think all the research I've seen says that within the, the, the unionist loyalist community, there's very, very high support for Bill of Rights. Yeah. I think there's a, we'll see, the Human Rights Consortium, I think, yes. did this research. Yeah. And you, you know, you're talking 80 plus percent yeah. saying we're, we're in favor of these things. And you know, you, you, you're making the distinction between sort of aspirational and judiciable. And you know, I do think a Bill of Rights should have a preamble, which is which is not enforceable by law, but is to a certain extent aspirational, inspirational. But is is the the explanation for why what follows follows. Exactly. And and while it mightn't be judiciable, you would imagine a judge would look at it yes, to do. understand what the drafters of this legislation yeah. intended. That's what they do with the treaties. Right. And then you go mm -hmm. into the judiciable yeah. rights. Mm -hmm. And as you say, a lot of them are progressively realised, so if you want to have a right that is, say, everybody has the right to good quality appropriate housing, mm -hmm. you don't deliver it in a mandate, because if you do that you've no money for the health service or for the education system, but you, you take steps in the, in the right direction and you don't step backwards, you keep going forwards. So again, what, I mean, what is wrong with that? Why would anybody say I can't put my hand up to that. I think it's also the sovereignty question. Mm. I'm sure that's the case because that's what I heard. But, you know, Winston Churchill drafted the European Convention on Human Rights. People forget that. And he <coughs> was, it was as British as custard. <laughs> um, you know, so the idea that you're losing your sovereignty mm -hmm. because you're going to Europe for a convention. Mm -hmm. And often the conventions are international conventions. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that because it was the incorporation of the European Convention and the whole attitude towards Europe perhaps also, that it's taken our sovereignty away to have a court in Strasbourg decide on the laws of the United Kingdom. But court in Strasbourg doesn't. It gives a huge margin of appreciation to the domestic courts of every country. Again, that's not understood. It's simply that foreign court in that foreign land is telling us, the people and citizens of this country, what to do. Mm. It's an awful lot of education is needed to embed it, that kind of culture of rights yeah. that is, make, gives us connections, mm. um, as the Universal Declaration did, mm. um, that it's not just an overlording us from a foreign mm. place and telling us what to do. Mm. It's, near, it's, nearly become, it's nearly become a right, uh, an ultra-right wing mantra that uh, human rights are not for us, equality is not for us. Um, the, these are namby-pamby things that, that suit all the things that, that we oppose. Um, and you can see that in terms of refugees, asylum seekers, migrant workers. And they think, I they think they, there's, a, there's a blame placed on Europe for, for all of that. And it's, it becomes muddied in terms of when we're talking about human rights and when we're talking about a bill of rights it's nearly like europe's to blame for for all of this and it's not we know it's not true we know that this is universal um and we'd like to say i mean we complain about um for example human rights abuses in china human rights abuses in in, in russia and we hear people standing up and jumping up and down about about them because they're happening over there and because they're happening you know in far distant places but there are human rights abuses happening here. Um, but we just, you know, we're not all sure about them or they're not all visible or um, maybe they're not the type of human rights that we want to be, want to be talking about. Um, so there, maybe there is a, a right-left issue as well as about, a, you know, a class issue here mm -hmm. when, it comes, when it comes to rights. I have a question in, um, and I'd appreciate your thoughts around this. It's from the Northern Ireland Rural Women's Network. And they've asked, what are the next steps we need to prevent a Bill of Rights in Northern Ireland stalling again? I mean, do, do, you, make, do you see the Ad Hoc Committee, you know, getting together again? Or do you think we've, we've passed that point? Well, I'd have to say, Don, I'm not on it at, at the moment. Mm -hmm. I have been moved on to the, to the economy. Um, the, the impression I'm getting is that it has hit a brick wall. Mm -hmm. So you'll certainly not see anything uh, before Christmas. But something has to happen mm. to, to, to get the wheels turning again between now and the end of the mandate. And, mm. and I don't know what it is because the DUP seem to have, mm. have dug in. But I, I believe the intent back in 98 was, was that recommendations would be put for Re Westminster to legislate rather than the Assembly. Mm. So will Westminster find the courage uh, 
to pick it up. Mm. I mean, I, I made the point when I was on the committee that, that there is a line between seeking consensus, which I was very keen on, that all, far, all five parties around the table would come to, to say, yeah, this is what we want. But at a certain point, that becomes a veto. Mm. If, mm. if you're absolutely determined to have consensus, then you're basically saying to people, well, if you want to block this, just sit in your hands yeah. and say nothing. Yeah. And that has been, yeah. been happening. I Can think we, we made a mistake in the first assembly. Yeah. There was to be a human rights and equality committee. Um, and the SDLP and the Elsie Unions at the time couldn't agree who would chair it, because oh. it's meant to be a member of the opposition. And so it never happened. Mm. Now, that was a huge mistake, because I like the Joint Committee of Human Rights at Westminster, mm -hmm. made up of members of the House of Lords mm -hmm. and the House of Commons. And they deliberate, not just on what's happening in terms of rights in other countries, but also on domestic rights. Mm -hmm. And they're brilliant debates and brilliant reports, and they have brilliant assistance from their clerk. And their clerk came here at one stage, a scholar, a legal scholar from Oxford, came here, and he was really shocked that we didn't have this. Now, what people don't remember, forget is that human rights are still not a devolved matter. No. Equality is, mm -hmm. but human rights mm -hmm. is not, and partly because it's the UK government that signs the treaties. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, it should be Westminster mm -hmm. that should be legislating, not just because of the peace agreement, mm -hmm. but also because it was never devolved mm -hmm. to the Assembly. Now, why it demanded consensus to the Assembly in my time was the Sewell Convention. Mm -hmm. But this convention, it's bypassing it now in yeah. relation to the legacy proposals. Of course, yeah. It's yeah. bypassing yeah. it in terms of all these others. Yeah. So it shows you it's all down to political will. And yeah. also to the governments who were mm. the people who signed the treaty, uh, the Good Friday Agreement. They are um, expected to uphold it. And I asked the Attorney General here, if you renege on that, which is a mm. peace accord, where do you go? Mm. Apparently to Vienna. Well, nobody has ever gone to Vienna, so maybe the Rural Community Network could mm. support us in taking a public interest case mm. to, the v to Vienna to see well, why has this not been implemented. Well, funny enough, they've, they've, um, the second part of their question is, do the panel think that the UN government's intention expressed this week to review human rights makes this time critical? Mm. Um, and Monica, mm. you've probably more experience of the British government, the Conservative government, mm -hmm. who were just coming in mm -hmm. um, when your time, mm -hmm. we were coming to the end of your time on the, on the Commission. And we know that the Conservative government are no friends of human rights mm -hmm. whatsoever. Um, and they've talked often about reviewing the Human Rights Act, which is quite concerning. I find it quite concerning because I'd be afraid that they'd try to start mm -hmm. watering things down. And I heard very recently um, that they're looking to cut the budget of the Human Rights Commission again, probably to the point where they may be unable to carry out their core functions. Yeah. What are the implications yeah. of, of, of well, that? Well, I left the Human Rights Commission a year early in protest mm. against that very change. Mm -hmm. When I realised the Conservatives intended to do a review of the Human Rights Act, I thought this is not only are we never going to see the light of day on a Bill of Rights, but the very rights the Commission is expected to uphold and which the Assembly has to take into account mm -hmm. when it's passing legislation is actually going to be uh, redrafted. Well, that was back in 2011 and it's 2021 that's still talking about reviewing it. Mm -hmm. So what it did was it introduced, now it wasn't just the Conservatives, it was Labour. Mm -hmm who entered just the notion of a British Bill of Rights, mm. which was a bit of a nonsense. Very expensive piece of um, thinking in terms of getting in experts and sitting down, and then it said Northern Ireland will have a separate chapter. Well, if there was going to be a veto in terms of the Northern Ireland Assembly against a Bill of Rights being seen as a place apart, there certainly would have been a veto mm. against anybody suggesting mm. that that was in keeping with the peace agreement that as a separate chapter mm -hmm. on what actually should have been called a United Kingdom Bill of Rights, yes, not a British a, yeah. Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. And then in comes Scotland. And Scotland, of course, is actually advocating that it should have its own Bill of Rights. Um, so all of those things are in play. Mm -hmm. But um, in 2021, with Brexit, the European Convention rights are the only rights we have. And it's because we're part of the Council of Europe 
you have to have um, the Human Rights Act, you have to have the European Convention rights. So I'm not sure that Boris Johnson has much wriggle room. And, uh, he can talk all he wants about reviewing, um, and he may, he may indeed draft legislation amendments to the current Human Rights Act, <coughs> which could water it down. Mm. Um, but that debate has gone on for over a decade and got nowhere. Mm. But we need to hold on to what we've got rather than go backwards. And in terms, just, just in terms yeah. of the Human Rights Commission itself, if they cut the core budget so drastically that it's unable to carry out its core function, what happens to its accreditation? It mm. wouldn't get accredited. It, it, it was under my time that I got it accredited at the UN. The reason why we got it accredited was because it was Westminster that set us up. Had we just been a regional, because they're worrying about Catalonia mm -hmm. um, and other places that um, they said, oh, well, the next thing you'll know, they will want UN accreditation. So we got it. We got a status because we were independent um, and not picked um, as they do in other countries, unfortunately. They pick their own parties to be on it, so it's not that independent. But it's, as you say, Don, mm -hmm. if you don't have the resources, you'll not do much enforcement mm -hmm. and you'll not do many investigations and you will water down its powers. Mm -hmm. So it's by the back door. But I did talk to the Human Rights Commission and they seem as a result of Brexit, which is kind of a oxymoron in a way, they actually got more resources to work with the Southern Commission, which it's mandated by the Good Friday Agreement to do mm -hmm. and to meet every quarter. As a result of Brexit, they actually gave them more resources um, so that there wouldn't be a fallback. This is uh, the dedicated mechanism under, yeah. the, under the protocol. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. but that's only part of it. Um, and we have a really good new Human Rights Commissioner, mm -hmm. who I, as Alison Kirkpatrick, mm -hmm. um, who I'm certain, and she was the barrister, who yeah. did the um, to the Human Rights Committee and the police yes. and oversaw that. A very experienced individual and I hope she will be a brilliant advocate mm -hmm. in maintaining the resources of the Commission mm -hmm. because yeah. watering it down is mm -hmm. not adhering to the Good Friday Agreement. And we're in a very unsettled period here in Northern Ireland. And if we do not have an institution as strong as the Human Rights Commission, I would say that the unionists should start getting as worried mm. as perhaps the nationalists yeah, might have been absolutely. in the past. May, may I raise a couple, couple of issues? Sure. You, you used a phrase from the, from the agreement um, about the uh, particular circumstances of Northern Ireland. And I wonder what you think of that 23 years on, because it's my impression that opponents use it as a stick to beat us with, arguing, well, well we're no different from England, Scotland and Wales, so it's not particular. Mm. <laughs> as, as British as Finchley, as Margaret Thatcher would say, well, mm. it's to fail to understand the agreement. I mean, the whole point of the agreement is you're British, Irish, or both. Well, that does, at the very start, set you apart. Um, and also, you know, the, the very equivalency of rights that we're talking about in terms of North and South, all of those come into play. So there's not not much of a stick to beat anybody with when you come to talk about the particularity of Northern Ireland. Okay, And the, the other issue, which again is in the agreement, and I can't quote the exact words, Monica, but it is effectively, if we legislate in this jurisdiction, then the Government of Ireland will look to make sure that they uh, do something that is equivalent. And uh, Judge Richard Humphreys came up to the Ad Hoc Committee and mm. I mean, he, he, he was pretty appalled, I, I felt, at, at this suggestion. Because effectively, we in this jurisdiction would be legislating for Dublin if they have an obligation to, to level up. Well, they, have, uh, they don't have an obligation to level up. I've just made the point that there's, mm. the levelling up is missing. Mm. And that but was the charter, which was also in the peace agreement that has been totally ignored. But but actually, I don't know Judge, what it says in the, in the document. Uh, no, Judge Humphreys, I think I read his book. Now, he really made a radical proposal that there should be judges from both sides sitting. On that. on that and looking at how, the, but that, that can't be a bad thing if there's equivalency on both sides of the border. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, if you live in a Newry and go across to Dundalk, your rights don't automatically mm. get diluted. Yeah. Um, so it's re really important to note, uh, Mike, the point that was made by Daphne Trimble was different again. She thought there would be rights tourists would flock to Northern yeah. Ireland from the rest of the UK, given that we would have all these yeah. rights. You know that? To, to our courts. Yeah, yeah, to, <coughs> our, to, to Northern Ireland to benefit from all these rights. Mm -hmm. 
Now, we said that will never happen. She thought we were making Northern Ireland so unique and so particular by the advice mm -hmm. we were offering that it would bring people here right because they would, it would be much more rights-based country than any other part of the UK. Um, that's not to understand the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland if you add additional rights to the European Convention rights that were, um, to be fair, incorporated into the Human Rights Act. That was another stick of the fight. You've got the Human Rights Act, mm -hmm. what more do you need? Mm -hmm. Um, and of course there are those particular circumstances that I've just mentioned mm -hmm. that should be added. And anyway, those convention rights are 50, 60 years old now. Yeah. You know, they weren't thinking like the Universal uh, Declaration of the Disability yeah. um, yeah. Community rights of the Children's child. Rights. rights the child. Um, environment. No, and most definitely in fact climate justice. Mm -hmm. Those rights are the current rights. And, and reproductive justice. And it should be a dynamic instrument. Mm -hmm. It has to be, it has to, you know, as we realise more and more the abuses that exist and the inequalities and the discrimination that exists, any um, Bill of Rights that we have has to be dynamic, it has to move, you know, in order, because we discover them all the time, as, as we know, it, it's only when situations come up and arise that something happens in court and they say, We've no jurisdiction over this. Yeah. That something has to change in order in order to be able to look look after that and make it right. And you know, how much have we benefited from the best interests of the child? Mm. And to think that we didn't they did they didn't think of that after a war in 1948, children didn't have rights. Mm -hmm. um, and look at the violations of ch uh, against children, mm. and the abuses of children, the ne neglect of children in state institutions. Mm -hmm. Um, and actually the Irish constitution had to be changed because it was the best interests of the parents <coughs> that overlaid the rights of the child and hence in a famous adoption case the, the child was taken given back to the birth parents uh, which was sad and the recognition that it was in the best interests of the child um, and they amended the legislation accordingly so it shows you even it had to change mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think when we when we have a discussion about human rights that is abstract and not connected to Northern Ireland, there's a tendency to forget about the conflict and coming out of conflict, how we dehumanise one another to the point of hatred and violence, and that building peace and reconciliation is about rehumanising the other, and how human rights and equality is very much part of that process. So the when what we're talking about is the unfinished business of, of reconciliation. Um, and maybe that's, Mike, you talked about it in terms of the relationships at the assembly, the relationships on the ground. You know, how people, um, there's more working class people that have support for human rights and a bill of rights and equality than there is right, right across the board, I think. And maybe there's a lesson there to be learnt amongst the politicians for the people being way ahead once yeah. again um, and is this a tool is our human rights and equality a tool that we should all be using in order to help build peace and, and reconciliation yes. and why why are we not embedding this within our politics well let's be optimistic on that score they are doing it mm -hmm. in the schools mm -hmm. one of the, the best days i had was going to Strandmillis primary school and watching the, the age appropriate learning from P1 upwards mm -hmm. on rights, mm -hmm. and those kids got it. And that's the next generation. Mm -hmm. um, now, you might well ask, could these kids not be sharing the same school instead of different schools, learning the same issues? Mm -hmm. And there's projects like the one I'm involved in called Politics and Action in Schools, where it's facilitating conversations between teachers who are a bit nervous about these issues, but they're not actually that nervous about teaching um, human rights and they are teaching <coughs> the conflict and the violations of the conflict through a lens of human rights. So I'm quite mm. optimistic mm. about that and that's the generation that's coming behind us. Um, now whether it, given the segregation of our communities, whether that's getting through to the kids who most need it, who are most segregated, is another question. Um, and therein lies the whole issue of how these are interdependent. Mm. Uh, yeah. The issue of integrated education, the integrated of shared housing, yeah. the issue of children being educated on these issues together so that they can then have these difficult contentious mm -hmm. discussions. Mm. Kids get climate justice. Yeah. They get 
um, the <laughs> best interests of the child more than perhaps our generation does. And they were the ones that turn around to us and tell us, do you know that you're ruining our country? You're ruining the mm. future mm. for us. Yeah. I think, I think one of the, the, the things the executive got wrong um, in yeah. terms of, you know, they have these shared educational campuses they want mm -hmm. to create and then there's shared housing. They're not together. I mean, mm. the shared housing should really envelope mm. the educational establishment. But mm. you know, one's here, one's there. But in, in terms of, of, of legacy, Don, of, of the conflict, I think one of the, the big ones is the number of people with poor mental health and well-being mm. who are waking up in the morning with, with no sense of purpose, with no reason to get out of bed. Uh, and it would be great to see them you know, having you know, a life that was based around you know, what they consider to be like a worthwhile job. Mm. And that's not to say when they wake up in the morning they don't have obstacles to overcome or hurdles to jump. Mm. But it's knowing that those hurdles are no higher mm. than, than the next person. Yes. And I think that's where the Bill of Rights mm. comes in to say, no, we guarantee if there is a hurdle, then it's, it's the same height for everybody. Mm. Yeah, I mean, legacy is a big issue when it comes to, to human rights and uh, equality, as we know, given yeah. what the British government did, have decided to do with legacy. But and, and, and they're absolutely determined, yeah. and it's so the wrong. Rwanda is dealing with that whole issue mm. so much better mm. than we are. Mm. And my last visit there, I was amazed at how they were dealing with trauma. Now they had a genocide, um, mm -hmm. and it was you know millions upon millions of people. Mm -hmm. um, but when I went there, I saw the resources that are being put into mental health. Mm -hmm. Here it's mostly physical health, mm -hmm. rather than mental health. And mm -hmm. as someone who had a sister who died by suicide, I wrote a piece in my book about the importance of human dignity. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not costing money. It's not, you know, asking for a huge financial commitment into the mental health service. It is about a culture that's based on the human dignity of the person. And she described herself, my sister Noling, as a China doll broken in millions of pieces, that no one was listening to mm -hmm. her, that she couldn't get through what was going on and the help that she needed. We are miles and miles behind in dealing with trauma of the troubles, but also in dealing with the everyday mental health depression mm -hmm. and, and trauma that is coming with austerity and, and unemployment. Mm -hmm. So those are human rights issues yeah. and we need to make those connections. I I we, try, we shouldn't finish without I just saying wanna, stand up, speak out yes, as Monica's book. I just want to finish, <laughs> Black on a, Staff finish, Press. finish on a high note um, as <laughs> Monica's book that's been published in, in recent days, which is really all about activism um, and your activism from the civil rights 1960s, you know, right up to what you're continuing to do today all around the world in your peace building um, and, you know, women's rights and, and, and other things. So, um, last comment, Monica, for you. <laughs> uh, thanks, Don. <laughs> I think that um, simply the term activating human rights, mm. that it's not an abstract thing, it's, it's something, it's everybody's business. And we should all stand up and speak up for them. Thanks, Monica. And thanks, everyone, for, for joining us this evening. I hope you've enjoyed the conversation. I've certainly enjoyed the conversation. I'd like to thank my guests, Mike Nesbitt and Monica McWilliams. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>